sometimes I get records that, you know, and this could be a single or EP or or maxi single or an album that feels like it belongs to a certain era, like the 90s or the 80s or 70s or whatever, or it needs to sound like a cassette or a, or a vinyl. And then I'll try to mimic that sound and bring it back to that era or, or format sound. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. Hey Rockstars, it's your host Lid Shaw and welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Maor Applebaum, a mastering engineer and musician for major international acts such as Faith No More, Yes, Walter Trout, Eric Gales, Meatloaf, William Shatner, um, Sepultura, Rob Halford, and many more. He's mastered the works of well-known music producers such as Matt Wallace, Mike Klink, Mike Plotnikoff, Bob Horn, Ben Gross, Roy Z, Sylvia Massey, and many others. To Maor, being a mastering engineer is the best way possible to combine a love and passion for music with various skills, objectivity, subjectivity, and technical and artistic prowess. He finds pleasure in his job more than anything thanks to the variety of music and sounds he gets to master from all over the world. It's a profession he takes real pride in and masters. Maura also has some great videos that have included in a YouTube playlist where he is interviewed by various folks like Dave Pensato and Warren Hewitt to talk about mastering from his studio in Los Angeles, California. Please welcome Maor Applebaum to Recording Studio Rockstars. Maor, I know we've been trying to set this up for a while, but I'm glad to have you here. And are you ready to rock? Yes, I am. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. It's a pleasure. Uh, I, we were talking about this beforehand, but uh, as I recall, you and I ran into each other on the floor at the AES conference last fall. So we've been um, emailing back and forth, and I'm glad to have you finally here. Yeah, it was cool running into you in uh, New York AES. And uh, as a lot of things, it takes time, but we finally made it. So. Uh, I'm happy and let's make it happen. <laughs> Indeed, man. Well, so, you know, I did a very brief introduction here. You've obviously done a lot of great work. And like I said, I've, I put together a YouTube video with a bunch of your music links in there, um, as well as some interviews um, that you have with Dave Pensato and Warren Hewitt and other, other great interviewers. And, um, but, you know, tell us in your own words how you got into all this stuff. I mean, did you start out making famous records? I, I guess I didn't. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, you know, my background was uh, kind of an all-around person. I was a DJ at some clubs. I also did some radio DJing, and I was a music journalist in a in a magazine and in a webzine. And I had a small distribution company and small licensing company, and uh, I did. At music as a musician in addition you know i've I've recorded albums of my own bands and projects um i i think i released around 20 albums and i recorded around 40 of my own or collaborations with other people wow and uh and i worked in studios and i worked in broadcasting for eight years so I kind of was here, there, everywhere. You know, I was teaching audio. I was con an audio consultant, also audio video consultant. And I designed some stuff. So I, I kind of had my hands in different areas of the audio field and the video field and even lighting engineering a bit. Um, Lighting's pretty fun. I've only done a tiny bit of it, but it's it's actually a blast when you get a chance to do it. Yeah, it was fun, and 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 it helps you also visualize ideas. And um, 
it was interesting to do that. And I did some live sound as well, or monitor engineering or backlining for shows. I also worked in rehearsal studios as the, the guy operating the studio. So you kind of get yourself immersed with a lot of music, a lot of situations with people um, and working things out. And um, kind of recorded some stuff and I mixed some stuff and I mastered some stuff. But the more I did it, the more I found myself uh, gravitating more to mastering and liking it more. Yeah. And that all the background that I have is actually really beneficial to the mastering process because uh, the mastering is really the buffer between the, the, the project and the listener. And, and me having the background as a DJ or a radio DJ or a broadcasting engineer or a music journalist, you're actually dealing with a final product out there. You know, even as a distribution company or a licensing company, you're also dealing with that. Yeah, so indeed. So I gravitated more and more to it. And um, and I, I think that's what I can bring to the table because um, I wasn't trained – or mentored as a mastering engineer. So I didn't pick up certain things. I had to learn by myself, make a lot of mistakes, learn from them, make more mistakes, learn from them, try out different things, learn from that, be open to things that sound ridiculous, but you got to try them and figure out if it works. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, all that brings uh, a lot of uh, interesting things to the table because my listening is different nowadays than I probably would listen, you know, 20 years ago. You know, when I think about that, I think about the mastering. You talked about all these other aspects of reaching the public and why that meant it was a good fit. Is there anything else about mastering that made you feel like you, you were really drawn toward? Is there something about, you know, working with the final mix as opposed to working with a musician, you know, with a guitar in their hand or anything like that? I think um, in in the audio profession, you know, you can you can do a lot of things, but there are things that you'll be better at. Um, I I like producing, but I'm not I'm I'm a good producer to myself or to people, but I'm not a good producer in terms of the psychology psychology involved. You know, where I have ideas, but I'm not the person that would sit with somebody and, and try to bring a good take from them by working the psychology magic in the picture. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I think I'm less good at a recording state because you got to have a, this kind of face that can be so neutral. So somebody working with you doesn't feel like there's a problem with their take, you know, right. like, like really good recording engineers or tracking engineers, whatever you want to call it, they have the ability not only to to use their skills in microphone placements and and all that, which is on you know it's it's an art by itself, uh, knowing where to position the mic and how to set the pre and mic and all that, but they also have the ability to uh, uh, be very transparent in the room, or sometimes be like maybe um the person in the room that knows how to guide the person yeah and i think that i'm less good at that and it's better that i put my better qualities than just put something that i can do not the best so i think recording is something i'm less good at on a, on a psychological level. Right. Well, I imagine that you arrived at this understanding of yourself, you know, over time and experience. Do you feel like some of the things that you learned about yourself were um, through trying some things and then not really liking doing it as much? Or did you also have the experience of just, you know, you talk about seeing really good tracking engineers. If you're in a place like Los Angeles, I mean, you may have an opportunity to to see some people in action that you really admire. Do you feel like that really helps as well? Well, I got to this notion before I moved to America. Okay. But, but when I moved to America, I also saw that there are technical and artistic things that I can do. 
but again, it stops on a psychological level where, you know, as a mastering engineer, it's easier for me because I'm dealing with a final product, even though it's a very sensitive area. But I'm not responsible for how the guitar player is going to do his uh, recording in terms of how uh, stressed he is about it. Stress he is about it. Or yeah. I, I can't influence anything on the recording side. Yeah, well, and, and I find some people are really patient about sitting while a musician just plays something over and over and over again. And I am actually not always that way. I get pretty impatient. So I, I, we don't have to continue down that path, but I, I appreciate that you share with us a little bit of your process there of arriving at what you wanted to do, which is so important for everybody. I, I think that once you get the understanding of where you're really good at and where you can really push, that's where you should be in order to get the maximum. Yeah. And, and I learned that I can do a lot of things to a certain degree and they might be okay, or might be better or, or, or good or bad. But mastering is something that I can really put myself into and improve all the time. At least I hope so. Yeah. Uh, because there's nothing else that it's taking that attention from me. Yeah. Well, so, so um, I apologize for asking you this again, but what, what was your instrument when you were playing music of your own? I was a bass player. Okay, cool, cool. And, and then, I, and where were you again before you came to the States? I was in Israel. I, um, I, I, I lived in Israel for a lot of years, and I was born there, and I lived there most of my life. And uh, I was a bass player, and I also played... Um, different instruments like synthesizers and stuff like that because i i like working on sound you know i wasn't a guitar player so i don't know how to play guitar you know i can make some noises on it some of them might be working good with the project but you know some of it might work but not uh i'm not a guitar player or i'm not a drummer i'm not nothing else but there bass playing, i could play good enough for what i was working on i was never a session player if somebody's never been to Israel and experienced the music scene there, would you like to um, talk about that just a little bit, just to kind of give somebody an understanding of what music is like over there? Well, first of all, let's start with that. Israel is a very beautiful country. It's multicultural on all bases, like languages. There's people speak a few different languages there, uh, even though the spoken language is Hebrew, but people speak English there because they learn it from a young age. There's other languages as well. Uh, even street signs are like in three languages, Hebrew, uh, English, and Arabic. So you can, they're all in three languages there. Wow. In most cases, unless there are certain streets, certain places where it's just in Hebrew. But um, but a lot of the signs are in different languages. Um, geographically, it's a beautiful country. You have the Dead Sea, which is the lowest place on Earth. You have the Red Sea, which is a beautiful sea with all these really nice, uh, colorful uh, sea creatures and fishes. Um, and then, of course, you have the uh, Sea of Galilee and you have just the Mediterranean Sea. There's a lot of things to do there. Uh, people are very warm, uh, very friendly, and it's kind of what you see is what you get, you know, no hidden agenda. They're really upfront, really social. Food is amazing, amazing. <laughs> healthy, you know, from the from the simple food to the more complex food. Everything from from hummus and falafel to really, you know, esoteric stuff, really good. It's a very technological co country. A lot of things that you guys use nowadays are actually made in Israel, developed in Israel. For example, Intel chips, their the R and D of them is in Israel. Uh, if you use Waves plugins, those are designed and made in Israel. That's what I was thinking of, too. Yeah, even Waze, the company who makes the navigation. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> Google Bot is Israeli. Uh, there's a lot of communication companies. Motorola, they have a lot of R&D there. IBM, Microsoft, they all of them have them R&D there. Uh, even USB drives, those were invented in Israel in the end of the 80s. So there's a lot of stuff. That. What a trip. What a great answer to my question. Thank you for that really in-depth description. It was very cool. Even on the music side, people are very open there to music, you know, because 
because it sits in a place where it's close to Europe. You get a lot of music from Europe. You get a lot of music from America. And you get a lot of uh, or regional music, domestic music. Mm-hmm. So it's a combination, kind of like an amalgam of uh, amalgam. Uh, um, how do you Amal- say that? Amalgam, yeah. Amalgam of things. And um, it's not a big music industry there. Uh, it's sort of, it's, it, you know, I, I, I did an... Uh, um, well, I actually, I didn't do the record with him, but I had somebody staying with me here, a guy named Eric Berman, who was an Israeli artist, and he came over to Nashville to make a record years, years ago. And so I got a little bit of an insight into it, and it just seemed really fascinating to me. Like, it's it's a small, sort of a small music community, but it's very um, supportive, I thought. And um, and it reminded me a little bit of, like, what when I hear stories about the Canadian music scene where... It's supportive of the local musicians. Is that is that accurate? I think in Canada there's a bit more support because uh, Canada exports a lot of music, um, you know, to America and to the world. I mean, you have a lot of bands from Canada that are quite famous. Rush is a good example, you know. Um, but also you have a lot of very famous engineers and producers from Canada that move to America. So in Israel, it's a different case. Uh, there's there's uh, there's a good chunk of Israeli musicians who made it overseas and actually made it really big. Um, but nice. our industry in Israel is not an exporting industry of music, where let's say Sweden is or Canada is. Right, right. Well, very cool. And and uh, we don't have to uh, stay on that tangent too much longer, unless you want to. Um, but I do like to ask our guests to share an inspirational quote to kind of kick us off on the podcast. And I wonder if there was anything you wanted to share to get us excited about hitting the studio. You mean if I have a special quote? Sure, if you if you want. If you don't, no worries. No, I have one. I'll tell you. All right. I work to get work, and it works. All right, I like it, man. Um, to elaborate on that, and and you know, tell us sort of the you know, the thinking behind that. The thinking behind that is actually where I come from originally. Um, In Israel, you have to really work hard to make a living and we have to work really hard to make, to keep the ball rolling because our music industry is not big in terms of money, in terms of studios, in terms of everything surrounding it. We have to really hustle in order to do this. And when I came to America, I came around 2007 when economy kind of hit here. And a lot of people were kind of uh, surprised. I wasn't surprised because where I come from in Israel, we had the same economy. Only <laughs> it was stable, good. It was stably not, not good. You know what I mean? It was not cheap. You know, you, to buy a meal costs you two hours of work. But uh, wow. So so I came with that notion that I got to keep the same mentality of I got to work to bring the work in. And as long as I do that, I can keep myself busy. And the first thing I did when I came to America was I, I worked for producer Sylvia Massey. And I actually I worked for her for free for eight months. I just, you know, it's you can call it an internship, but. I didn't do stuff that interns do. I actually, I worked on the console. I, I did some mastering for her. I did some recording for her. I did some mixing for her. I did some, you know, studio all around stuff for her, you know, whatever's needed. But I, I had the, the passion and will willpower to do this, to learn how much I can push myself further. And after working for her for around eight months, I moved to LA. And I just worked hard, hustling, you know, getting, try to get work my way. And uh, the first thing I did is, you know, first two weeks is I figured, let's go work at a store, record store, uh, not a record, a uh, um, music store, I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, so I worked for Sam Ash for four months. And during that time, I was also going out there, pe- meeting people, giving business cards and and working really hard. So the four, first four months I was working at Sam Ash during the day and in the night I was mastering projects that came in. And some of them were actually some big names like Ingve Malmsteen, oh, and right on. Alfred and a few others. 
uh, some of them were producers, some of them were projects, uh, musicians. But I, I really worked hard, and after four months, I couldn't do both of them, so I just left the left the work at the the Sam Ash and just continued mastering. And this is fast forward ten years. The past ten years, this is what I've been doing, and I've been just going out there, meeting people, meeting bands, meeting producers, trying out, you know, showing what I can, and just working to get the work in. Well, so, it was a good choice. I, th I think you're. We're glad you're mastering records rather than just um, selling guitars right now. Well, I didn't sell the guitars. I was selling pro audio gear. But actually, if if somebody asked me today, what is the first thing you need to know about building a business? Is you need to learn how to sell. Go work in a mm. shop because there's a difference between you're selling yourself by word of mouth, which means you did a good job, and somebody else does the work for you and tells somebody to come to you, then you actually learning how to sell yourself to people. And I think it's very important to know, you know, how to, how to be approachable. And when you're approached or when you approach people to state what you do and, and learned a lot during those four months. So do you want to talk more about, you know, the, how, how to sort of sell yourself to people? Maybe there's more you can educate the rock stars on. Well, first of all, is you really have to be passionate about what you're doing. Most of the people who say they're passionate, you know, they're not passionate enough. They might think they're passionate, but passion means you're sacrificing something for it. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're willing to sacrifice, you know, the things you like to do normally, then you're probably really passionate. Yeah. If you're willing to, to not go out every time and not sit on your uh, video games or whatever, watch a movie and all that. If you're willing to put that aside and just do what you're doing and become great at it, then you're probably really passionate about what you're doing. It's, it's, it's always, there's always a price. It's either you sit now and work more or work to bring your clients in or do something else. Yeah. I would, we're working to get the work done, bring the clients in. You know, and 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 do good work and invest in my craft, either learning more or trying more, and or buying the stuff I need to to buy to work with it. You know, yeah. invest in your craft and gear. So, well, you have a beautiful studio there, which I, I'd love for you to describe how you set up your studio. Um, but just to kind of reiterate what you're saying, I mean, we met at the AES conference in New York because you went out of your way to go to a conference and. Rockstars, that's one of the best reasons to go to any event where there are other people is just simply to meet other people in person, get out of your studio, get out of your space and meet people in a professional capacity or even just, you know, even if you're just doing this for a hobby and you want to learn more about stuff. And then, um, Maur, you also have a great website. It's simple and it's straight to the point and it looks great. And, you know, I remember you click on a link and there's this just a really impressive grid of records that you've mastered or, or mixed. And it looks awesome. And those are all important things. Are there any other strategies that people need to be reminded of as far as, you know, how to have a presence on the internet and how to pursue connections with people? Well, first of all, um, regarding my website, uh, this is an example of how a not good website, a not really good design website works for my benefit because I didn't have the tools and I don't know how to design anything nice in terms of graphics and we didn't really invest in that. But I, one of the things I learned is you can make a really nice, cool looking, flashy website and that can invite people. But what's really bringing the people to the table in terms of working with you is your results. And if they see these records that, that you've been part of, that's for them knowing that you're legit. Yeah. And that's why the website, even if it's a poor design and it's not a good website, it works. And um, but most of the stuff there I've mastered. There's only a few that I mix. I'm not a mixing engineer, but I've had a few things that I worked on, which I mixed, you know, prior. But uh, probably 90-something percent of there, probably close to 98 percent of there is is just mastering because that's what I do. I don't mix or don't record. But well, – uh, let me ask you a question, um, because I thought about that, too, and I thought about how um, it's one of the nice things about mastering records is they're so close to the finish line 
that you know the name of the album. They're probably working on the artwork already. And it's just about to be released, so you're probably going to get a link to it and be able to to add it. When you're doing overdubs for a record or tracking a record or you're somewhere in this process that's much earlier on, sometimes the record isn't released for quite a while and it can be a little tricky. I, have you heard other people talk about this, you know, the frustration of trying to link back to the record and get on the website, or am I just making this stuff up? <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't even know most of the records that I've worked on if they came out or not, because the databases are never updated. You know, if I go to my all music, I see 400 and something record if credit, 434 credits or something like that. That's not even half of what I've done, but I don't know where to find them. Sometimes I can find on Discogs stuff that are not on the all music. Sometimes I'll find it in a, in a different place. A lot of times I don't even have the cover artwork of the album and I don't even know if it's out. There's albums that were out and I only found out of that a year later or half a year later. Um, or or what or I never found out even. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm I'm basically I'm in the same position as somebody who was doing overdubs because I don't know when it's out. Sometimes records stay in the record label and takes a long time till they're out. Sometimes they don't even go out. Sometimes the artist just releases online something and you're like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. So what I have on my website is not updated. It's just 200 and something record covers that I put because I, I, it's hard for me to go out there and try to look which one is out and grab the photo and sure, I barely yeah. update that website. And so um, so it's, it's kind of hard to, to do that all the time. Well, it's but, probably probably a good reminder to the rock stars that um, just making some effort to organize it can last a long time. In other words, if you sit down and get 200 records, I probably don't need to click through more than 200 records on your website to be, you know, to get a good sense of of the quality of your work. You know, so just having done it once and putting putting something up there can really make a difference. I think even 10 will do the job if they're good records. It's just that in my case. I deal with so many different types of music and bands from all over the world. And sometimes that niche band is exactly what they like. So if I have it there, it helps them connect with me better. Like, yeah. oh, you did that record, which nobody heard of, but except them and a few others, but they like it. Then That's I'm like, funny. okay, cool. I mean, I, I was, I'm joking. It could be that, you know, 20,000 people heard it, whatever. It's just sometimes they need a connection with a different uh, type of music or, or release. And then they, they, that helps them. Um, seal the deal. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, it's well, sealed the deal. yeah. Well, so um, and now you have done a lot of international records. You work with um, artists from all around the world. Talk a little bit about um, how that works for you. Do you, uh, are there reasons why you're doing international artists and other people maybe aren't is there any advice you have for the rock stars if they'd like to connect with people on a larger scale across the globe well because i grew up on international music like i said stuff from america stuff from europe stuff from asia so you know like everything thrown all, to all directions it's natural for me to work that way too and i've been doing international stuff uh from you know way more than a decade like i've been like let's say this uh i don't even remember what year i started doing internet you know what maybe wow it's, it's going to be hard to remember but you know i've been communicating with with musicians and you know for, for way more than a decade you know from all over the world and it's it's natural for me to to, to kind of work on that in terms of, of being open to the different music styles and aesthetics. And there's subgenres, like there's even genres, you know, like in metal, you have different types of metal. You know, if you have death metal, then you have Swedish death metal, then you have mm -hmm. um, American death metal, and then you have the old school death metal. I just gave example on death metal, okay? But, you know, even in Prague, you have post Prague, you have classic Prague. You know, then you have pop prog, which was kind of like the prog that was more commercial. And then you have, uh, you know, even in blues, you have blues that is more old school. And then you have blues with gospel. And there's so many influences you can 
put in. And there's different aesthetics if this is a lo-fi sound or a hi-fi sound. And also live albums. Some of my clients have a big following in Europe, but they're here. So you make the album appeal to the crowd in Europe in terms of sonics because they like a certain sound. But yeah. you make the work here. So you learn how it sounds right. You know, certain bands in Europe want to sound American. So you give them American sound. And certain bands here want to sound more European. So you work on that to make it sound more European. And some of them Euro-American. Um, the, the, the hard thing about working international is you have to understand that there's a difference in mentality and in communications. And it's walking on eggs because it's easy to break it. Mm. If, if you don't understand the 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 the, the um, just you know, the way the, that people communicate. Yes, like some cultures are very upfront, like Israelis. I'm Israeli, you know. They they the email that you'll get or the phone call or the discussion won't be first of all trying to put a skirt on it or trying to sugarcoat or or be you know like how you doing? Hope all is well. How is this? How is that? You know, okay, we need you to fix this and this and this. A lot of them are to the point, which is good because, you know, if I'm talking to somebody I and he wants me to make changes, I want to hear what changes he wants. And if he's happy, I want to hear why he's happy because I want to get to it. I want to make sure it's it's happening. You know, I'm not offended. Like if something needs a change, they don't need to go around it. They can just say, you know, we like this or we didn't like this, but can you take this and move it to this? Can you make that change? You know, and, and some cultures are like that. You know, that's where yeah. I come from. Uh, and some cultures are a bit more polite, you know, and some of them will have this politeness and demandingness at the same time. You know, it will be like they're polite, but they can also ask specifics. So you, you kind of have to learn not to take it the wrong way. And even if it feels a bit like it's rubbing you wrong, mm -hmm. you know, try to understand maybe that's how they talk there. You know, don't don't immediately think they're bad. You know, and some of them, let's say, don't have good English and they might use terms that might sound weird. Like, for example, they might be using terms that are very either uh, not just demanding, but very like like they're screaming or something, but they're not. <laughs> you know, or like they're complaining, but they're not. They just don't have good English. And then they're just using um, uh, translation, you know. And, yeah. And, and oh, it might, right. Yeah. The Google translation. Yeah, and it might, you know, it might be like, like you need to tweak highs, and you're like, whoa. And basically, <laughs> they were just asking, can can you tweak the highs, you know, or whatever. That's really funny. That's so funny. <laughs> well, it's great advice though, because um, I'm sure that's one of the first struggles that people w will run into when they're working with international artists is not understanding why the communication is so awkward. And it sounds like your advice is. Just don't be hasty. Don't don't be reactive. Pause. You know, leave a lot of room for understanding. Yeah, and and another good thing that I recommend, and this is kind of, it, it's a thing that is happening less and less in the world. People don't communicate much, and and we we were actually, I think we went back in time. We're now around the era <laughs> of smoke signals, because. Um, we have the ability to talk and see each other with the technology, but yet people choose to email claiming it's the fastest way to reach them. I don't think it's true. It's I think not really true. I think email is a really, really bad way to communicate. It's good if you just want to get a certain message through, like we need this on that time. Could you add 2 dB of that? Could you, you know, it's good for that. It's good for it. it it's good when you don't need to elaborate uh, on a discussion unless it's like, okay, we've done this and this and this. Now we need this and this, you know, but when there's uh, emotional impact and there's a discussion involved, like an opinion involved and it, you know, it's always better if you can actually call on the phone or Skype or WhatsApp 
or on Facebook if there's an app, you know, if you work the community, you know, the phone call or video chat. Yeah. And then the second best thing is chatting. But just remember that words that are written they have way more power in a negative way than words being said. Because words that are written are like written as as in a book or in or in a guideline. Right, right. Very and then, so, you know, you have some people communicating through email as if it were a text message and some people communicating as if it were a long letter. Um, have you, I might be looking for something here, but have you also noticed that um, facial expressions uh, between different countries can be misinterpreted when you're doing the Skype call? Well, that can always happen, you know, and, and, and we have to understand that there's difference in culture. But but let's let's take the video side off for a second because because what you're saying is something that is even harder to read. Yeah. Okay. I mean, because different cultures might have certain, you know, and it's not just cultures, it's people. Some people, you know, they'll look at your eye like look in your eyes and you'll think, Oh, oh they wanna kill you. <laughs> no, they don't. They, they it's a facial expression, you know, that's how they are, you know, and you have to put that aside too. But that's why I say let's put the video side for a second off here, take it off for, for, for a second. Um, even communicating texts, you know that thing where you're trying to talk with somebody and you're finding yourself texting like 30 texts. Yeah, right. <laughs> Dude, give me a call. We'll figure it out in one minute of a phone call. And the cool thing about it is in a phone call, it's real time. Text is not real time. Yeah. People assume it is. But text, you could be doing something else and you didn't look at the text and you're waiting for a response. I'm, I'm for years, I've been struggling with, with the whole idea of communicating that way. Now I'm like, well, that's how they want to talk. Okay, we'll talk that way. But, you know, it, it has limitations. And if I get to a point where there is a problem and we're not sure, I always tell people, let's let's talk. Yeah. Well, you know who else was had very strong feelings about that on the podcast was Steve Albini. And mm -hmm. he was yeah, said the same thing. He's like, just pick up the phone and go, we'll sort this out in two seconds. So that's good advice. Well, let's... Let's, He's a smart man, right? He is a smart guy. He's a lot of fun to hang out with, too. Um, so, so Maur, let's dig into some questions about uh, about mastering. Let me let me ask you some stuff about you know what you do. Um, and I've got a, a list of questions here. I'll just kind of start at the top. But um, one of the first questions I thought to ask you was just simply, what are some of the problems that you hear in mixes that people send you, and how can we as mix engineers deliver you better mixes to be mastered? That's a big question. Okay. <laughs> and it require a big answer, but well, I have to kind of divide this to a few things. Uh, there's mixes that are really good in terms of balances mm -hmm. between instruments and tones. And then there's mixes that are really good in terms of the intention and the energy, but they might not as be as good in terms of balances and frequencies. And in those cases, those are good mixes, okay? Um, I consider them good because they generate something. You know, the one that maybe has good balance and, and tone, but maybe ha doesn't have the mojo, then we can mm. work the mojo in. The ones that don't have the great balance and tone, we can work the tone in. Then there comes the ones that are good mixes that have the great tone and the balance. And those we just want to work really good on not fucking them up. Yeah. It's an easy thing, by the way. It's really easy to fuck up a good mix. Okay? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm aware. Okay. So, <laughs> so what we want to do there is enhance them. Okay. And then those are the good ones. Now, sometimes what happens is you get a good mix in terms of balance and tone but there's a problem in certain areas and that is a monitoring problem. Like for example, you get a mix with too much low end. You know then that the place it was mixed or speakers or room or a combination of two probably cancels the low end and the mixer is not hearing that. Mm -hmm. And then you have two choices. One, you fix it with how you can fix it, with the tools that you have. Two is you isolate that problem and call the mixer and say, I think you have that problem. If you can clean up this instrument that does that, it will be better because then I don't have to cut that low end and I can keep the kick with the low end. But if you just clean the sub 
on the kick or the sub on the base. So that is better because if I get a mix that I need to fix a lot, I'll do that. But if I need to fix a lot because there's a problem that could be fixed better in the mix, I would recommend fixing it in the mix because then I can do even a better job enhancing it. Um, a good example for that would be like low end. If you have too much low end on a bass guitar, it's going to clog a lot of things. Or if you have too much sub on the kick, it will trigger limiting. Yeah. So if you clean that up and give me a new one, it will sound better and I can do better. Another uh, thing that happens is the high end. A lot of times when, when uh, rooms are not the best or speakers are not the best or a combination or even fatigue, when working a lot, um, you might get a lot of harsh high mids and high end. I can clean that up. The problem with cleaning high end is it becomes dull in a way and you have to really find the balance where if you just clean up that high end, it will just sound better. And a lot of times the high end is not an overall thing. It could be sometimes. But a lot of times it's like symbols are too loud and and and, and harsh, mm -hmm. or vocals have too much of that. If you fix the symbols, then I can open up the brightness and let the vocals come up nice. If you fix up uh, S's in the vocals, then I can brighten up the vocals and have the symbols sound nice. But it's usually the lows or the highs that have the extreme problems. Sometimes what happens is you have both of them together, but the lows are covering the highs. So once the lows are cleared up, then the highs jump higher. And it's not because they just jump now because because you made them jump. They were just there, but once you cut the lows, it opened it up and they, and they come up. Mm -hmm. And then you hear them better. So it's better to clean up the lows and then if the highs are jumping out, clean up the, those highs. Sometimes also people put EQs on the mixes and they boost a lot of highs in general, like a more of an overall mix brightening. And that could be also sometimes too much. Mid-range, that can be uh, louder, uh, too much congesting of it, either in low mids or high mids. Um, but that is easier to notice because when you just play, if your ears feel like it's like this, you know, Right. It's an immediate thing. Or if it's like this, usually you'll notice it more. Um, because most monitors will translate the mid-range. Uh, yeah, because mid-range, mid we're most likely to be able to hear across many different monitors and at many different volumes. Yes, exactly. The high end is depending on... Uh, a lot of um, you know the, the the way the tweeter is, but also how your room is reflective because it can cancel a lot of the high end, and you might be pushing even more. Um, low end, of course, you know not every speaker goes really down, 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 and also low end. Some some rooms don't have enough room to develop the the frequencies, and then there's cancellations there. Yeah, right, and and in your studio, you're, of course, able to hear a lot of these things accurately that we don't always hear when we're mixing. Mm -hmm. And I guess my, my question in response to you, what was going to be, is there some way, I've noticed that sometimes you get something back from mastering and you and these things are popping out. And you're like, oh, I didn't know I had those problems, but you just described it. You said it was because of things like, you know, you clean up the low end and now all of a sudden the high end comes forward and you've discovered it, un, it reveals problems. And my question was going to be, is there some way to um, mimic or emulate the the revealing quality while we're mixing? But I, I guess really the answer, if I'm hearing you right, is just you got to get your mix right before you it reveals it. So I don't know if there is a, a trick or a way to sort of give you a sense of what mastering is going to do while you're mixing it. Well, some people try to emulate the mastering process while they're mixing just in order to hear things. The problem with that emulation is it doesn't mean that's how it's going to be actually done. And sometimes they'll apply over processing, like, you know, they'll put too much multiband compression and different stuff, try to emulate it. And, 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 and they're trying to compensate for that. And actually it might not be what's happening really there. So, um, Going back to the question before, 
I want to inject something regarding uh, what was before and also adding to this. One of the obstacles sometimes that happens is too much processing on the mix bus. And some of the plugins do a, co a good job of making a nice curve that we like, but at the same time they do other stuff and it's too much and you get a lifeless mix or the movement is stuck. And, and sometimes they just get used to working like that and, and you need to kind of fix what they assumed was the right thing. And, mm -hmm. and it, there's no right or wrong, really. You know, um, if you overprocess something, it can't be, you can't undo it. I mean, you can try to mimic or, or quasi do something that can maybe <laughs> fix something or make it easier on the ear. But you have to be careful with those things because our ear gets used to things. It's like candy. You know, you put one, you're like, oh, this is really good. You know what? I want another one. You know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> you know, it's like it's a it's a snack. You know, when you start building up these plugins on your mix bus, and then I've had time where somebody would send me a, a mix, and he says, "Well, we we had uh we had our own mastering version that we did just to mimic what's happening." And I'm like, "Okay," and I did this album, and what I did came out really good, but the way they mimicked it took. They put so much processing to mimic mastering that it pulled the snare all the time, like really pulled it hard down. And mine didn't because I didn't right. go that direction. And it took us a while to figure out what's happening. And then I asked them for their chain, like what did they put to mimic the mastering? I think they were 18 plugins or something like that. <laughs> it was, I was like, wow. Whatever they put there, it was like, I mean, why do you think I'm going to put stuff like that? I mean, you don't need to mimic mastering with that because who says I'm going to go these directions, you know? Right, right. It, it, you know, you don't have to add from everything you have. And then um, especially, you know, things like snare or things like vocals, you know, they'll – they're they're affected really hard, you know, by limiting, you know, and kicks as well. But, you know, a vocal can get tucked in or a snare can tuck, get tucked in too. So it's important to be aware that you, if you want to mimic mastering, try to mimic it in the most minimal way you can. Like, like just put a normal limiter, not a, not a clipper, not a saturator, just a limiter, not a multiband. Not a two band, not a three band, not a four band, not a sixteen band. <laughs> Just one band, not under the hood, uh, multi band, but just one that you can, cr cr you know, crank the the threshold to 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 get loud and see how it affects. Because once you start putting saturators, clippers, level, there's devices that do level adjustment by clipping or saturating. But once you start applying these things, they change the tone. They change the whole curve of the song. And then you're not emulating exactly what you want to emulate. So it's better just to be as minimal as you can in terms of trying to emulate that if you put a limiter. You know, just strap an L2 or something like that, yeah. you know, just – like a single band and and see how you get there and if it if it sounds fine okay it's not exactly what the mastering engineer will do but at least you're not doing over over and over processing to try to emulate what the fifth mastering engineer might do <laughs> well so now um what about things like level and headroom do you have any advice for people about th you know just all the basics like what resolution file do you want from them? How how much head room is helpful? Things like that. And this is also a kind of a weird subject because a lot of people will say as long as there's no overs, as, you know, if it's zero, then it's fine or point one point. To be honest with you, I've checked a lot of the AWs of of how they respond. And I, you know, and I, I hear differences. You know, some I can say I'm crazy. Some can say what I'm saying is not logical or whatever. But I noticed that when you're a bit further from the zero, let's say minus three, and you have that headroom, 
somehow it sounds to me better. And I didn't choose that number because it's a three. I just started lowering down and noticed that between minus three and minus six, it sounded to me better. And maybe it has to do with a combination of how the DAW works in terms of, you know, how close it is to the DBFS, the actual zero DBFS, or how the uh, interface or converter in line deals with it. So I like to have some headroom. It, it lets me do my job better. Um, but that being said, I've got a bunch of projects that came in that were zero DBFS or 0.1 DBFS or 0.5 or three. And I worked with them as is, but I've seen times where I would just ask the person to lower down 3 dB and it just sounded better. And because they printed just a bit lower, it didn't hit the um, the actual DAW uh, summing or whatever you want to call it or center section as hard. And it just had some, um, I don't want to use the term air because it's not the term, but it had, it had space in it. It yeah. had enough headroom. Um, do, you, do you think that those cases, um, they were going into all the faders and turning them all down to just have a, a lower overall mix bus level? Or do you think they might have been able to take their master fader and simply turn it down a little bit to just drop the output level? Or is that, can, is that unfair for me to ask you that question? No, no, it's, it's fair to ask. I think you can just, um, you can work both ways. Um, I wouldn't ask, like, in some cases, it depends on their inserts. Some of them can just lower everything. Um, and But it, it, it's a bit of a different gain stage depending if you have any sends. And, um, you know, because if you lower your fader down and your uh, sends are post-fader, then you're changing how much you're hitting your reverbs. Right, right. You might change the nature of the mix, the balance. Everything. Right. If you do it early enough, you might be able to do that because then you're you're not in the end of the mix lowering everything, you know. Um, but there were times where my clients, uh, people, you know, uh, who who were the mixers in that case, lowered everything down and made a few adjustments and it worked. But in other cases, you can just lower your master fader uh, just so it's not hitting as hard. Uh, it depends if you bounce to disc or if you're uh, recording to a new track, like – sending your mix through the master bus and uh, going out to a bus and re-recording it to a new track. Right. Then it affects even that, then the effect of it is probably better because then you can monitor the level based on the actual track because your mix bus, the meter there might not show you if it's post fader, if it's, if it's pre fader, uh, it might not show you the actual level or if it's a uh, pre-insert or whatever it's set up. But if you send it out to <clears throat> to a new bus and re-record it on a new track, then the meter in that track will be post-master and you can set it up right. Um, right. Some, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, in something like Pro Tools, the metering could be showing you a level um, post-fader – as opposed to pre-fader, and also I believe master set or master output uh, tracks in Pro Tools, uh, the the output fader is pre-insert sometimes. So if you have mixed compression going and you bring the output master fader down, you're actually affecting how it's hitting the compressor. Right. So you can you can either do that, uh, you can either set the uh, insert to be post fader. Or pre-fader, you know, uh, usually inserts, usually by default, they're pre-fader from what I remember. Yeah. Um, but See, they, they should be. That seems logical. Right. That's Yeah. But uh, you can control that by the master output. And in the worst case, what you can do is if it's all post-fader, what you can do is you could go to the last insert in the chain and just lower down the output of it. Right. Put a trim on. Oh, yeah. Lower the output or put a trim plug in on or something. Yeah, yeah, and then try to get that range. And and like I said, you know, everybody has a different opinion on this, um, and and probably every opinion works here. Uh, but I I I personally heard differences between if it was hitting zero or it was hitting lower. Um, 
and and even the clients that I asked them, they heard a difference. So, you know, whatever I'm, I'm sent, I work with. You know, if I get something really like really going close to point one, point two, or zero dbfs, I'll work with it. But if you can push it lower. You know, it, it will be better, I think. Very cool. Well, let's take a pause for just a second. We'll take a break. Um, Rockstars, uh, I want to remind you that you can find links to what we're talking about in the show notes. And I've also included a YouTube playlist where you can go check out some of Maor's records and some other interviews that he's done. And if you are also at the learning stage for mixing yourself, uh, I have a free course to help you with your mixing called MixMasterBundle.com. And it includes multi-tracks that you can download and plugins. You know, just using free plugins, you can mix in any DAW. So go check that out if you want. We'll see you in just a moment for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Hey, rock stars. We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Maor Applebaum, and we're talking about mastering records. Maor, are you ready to jam? Yes. Groovy. So one of the things that we really didn't get into yet, but you hinted at it a little bit because uh, you were talking about metal, you have a real, um, you know, you've really created a... Um, uh, an identity for yourself, mastering a lot of metal records and heavy records. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you got into that, why you uh, have found a real ability to master heavy records. Well, first thing, just so we know for the record, I do a lot of other stuff. I do a lot of hip hop. I do a lot of reggae. I do uh, pop, uh, blues, rock, punk, industrial, gothic, singer-songwriter, country, I mean, you name it. It's yeah. like Zydeco, uh, nice. really a lot of stuff. Uh, folk, world music. Um, well, that's why, it, you know, I, I titled the podcast Mastering Heavy Metal, Rock, and Everything Else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to do Mastering the Next Generation. Nice. <laughs> yeah. But, um, um, and, and like, you know, as we talked before, you know, and I've, I've done – Artists, I've mastered, you know, songs for artists like Matisseau. Oh yeah, and, I wanted to ask you about him. I, I recorded him years ago at my Bonnaroo studio, and an interesting guy doing some really cool stuff. I, I haven't heard his more recent stuff, so tell us, tell us some about working with Matisseau. Well, I just did a single for him. It just came out a while ago. Uh, it's called uh, "Coming from Afar," and it's featuring uh, an artist by the name of Mavado. You can just YouTube Matisseau coming from afar and you'll see it's there. Um, so that's like an example, you know, one of the artists, it's a different genre, but but um, I've done, you know, I've did a single for Lupe Fiasco. I've done a lot of stuff that is totally far from, you know, uh, rock and metal. I've done classical music. I've done choral music, uh, things that appear in, you know, uh, video games and and placements. Um, the thing that people connect me a lot with metal and rock is because a lot of these artists that I worked with are very known or iconic in their field. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say in rock, I worked with Yes. I did four albums with Yes, one studio album and three double live records. So immediately, you know, that's a famous band. It's, you know, one of the iconic pioneering prog rock bands in the world. So of course, you can affiliate it with rock, or I've done Meatloaf or Faith No More. You know, Faith No yeah. More is 
the most known, you know, alternative metal bands, you know, they influenced generation, you know, like tons of people and in both metal and rock and alternative. And, and at the same time, working with Rob Halford, who is an iconic, um, you know, he's considered the metal God, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, Oh, or Ingve, you know, he's one of the top shredders in the world. So what happens is when you work with people like that, immediately you get affiliated with those genres. Um, I like metal music as well, you know, and I just, you know, I like a lot of types of music. And it was easier for me to gravitate to that genre in terms of spread because, um, because I knew the genre more. And... Um, in time, I, I work with some of these artists and they're known in their field. So, you know, you do Fate No More, then, and I've done two re two albums with them. You know, I did the comeback album, the album they did after 18 years of, you know, comeback. Nice. Uh, Victus, it's called. And uh, I also remastered the first album, We Care A Lot. So when you work with a band like that, you're going to gravitate some alternative rock and metal and bands that are, liking that band or influenced by them and same thing you know when you work with a band like yes or you know or you work with a band like uh you know uh, uh like star set which is a very current band um so that's kind of how it goes you know you work with something you you know the genre and you gravitate to and it brings you a lot of work and in time you get to work on other genres because you met the people and you offered your business or you met certain producers that tried you and they were happy with the results. And then you find yourself working with blues, you know, like Walter Trout. I did two albums with him. He's a legend in the blues era, uh, you know, and, uh, um, or, or Eric Gales. I've done two rec two albums with, uh, Eric Gales, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I've yeah, got some questions I wanted to ask you about many of these artists that you worked with. Um, but I thought, Maybe we should start out with asking you a really dumb question that would be a good uh, launching point. What is mastering and how do you do it? Why do you think the question is dumb? Because, <laughs> uh, uh, well, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I guess because uh, I, like anybody, am sometimes afraid to ask the basic questions for fear of sounding like it was a dumb question which I think is sort of at the core of, of a lot of the learning process for this stuff, and maybe even a little bit at the root of some of the communication challenges. Whereas like if you, if you master a record from, for me, I might be afraid to ask you some questions about changing it or about how it sounds or how it gets done. Um, so that's my answer to that. But, okay. um, but yeah, just, just introduce us to, you know, what is mastering and how do you describe what, what the process is? Are you just making stuff louder? It's more than that. No, no, no. Uh, it's not that. Well, let's start with. Did I cut you off? No, no, not at all, not at all. I'm just, I'm just giving you launching pads to, right. you know, tell us what you want. Okay. Well, first of all, there's no dumb question. Okay. There's just no question. There's either you ask it or not. Okay. Because it's better that people ask and get a response and an answer than not ask and assume wrong. So, well, mastering. There's a lot of things to think of it, you know, because back in the day, mastering was really taking something from formats that were not playable at home and then, you know, bringing it to something that could be later on played at home. Think of it as a transfer thing. Right. You know, if you didn't have, you didn't have a quarter inch or a half inch and, uh, and then the mastering was taking those reels and, making one thing and then creating, uh, uh, sending out to duplication, to pressing of, of a record or a CD or a cassette. But that's just the transfer function. Mastering has a lot of other things. For example, in mastering, we can enhance uh, the sound of the record to make it more engaging, to make it more moving, to make it more exciting, to make it feel more expensive to make it feel uh, like in a certain mood. Let's say the mixes were a bit bright, but the mood is supposed to be darker. We have the ability to do that. Let's say we want to excite the listener by um, adding certain frequencies that make it jump out, make it sound explosive, make it sound um, sizzly. You know, there's a lot of things you can do 
if if you look if you go if you go to a museum and you look at a picture, you're not just seeing seeing the picture. You're seeing a frame that is surrounding the picture. Mm-hmm. It could be a real frame or it could be no frame, but there is a frame and the frame could be just no frame as well. Okay, A frame could be something very thin or very thick or wooden or metallic that affects how you look at the picture. Another thing that affects the way you look at the picture is what's in the background. Is it a white wall? Is it a big wall? Is it sharing space with other pictures? What about the lighting? Is the lighting coming from a certain angle? Does it emphasize the um, certain contours? Okay, is the light bright, which makes it stand out? Is the light a bit darkish, which makes more shadows on it? All those visual stuff are being uh, um, represented in audio as well. In mastering, you can you can make the listener think that. The sound that is there is intentional from beginning, even though it might not have been, and it was done like that in the mastering. Right. Basically convincing the audience that this is intentional, this is how it should be. The mastering is a final process. It's basically saying, this is what it is, and this is how it's going to come out, and that's how you connect with the audience. I've worked on records that sounded good before they came to me, but I tweak them to make it more engaging. Now, in some cases, volume is in, is needed to be lifted a lot, you know, like really big time level adjustment. And sometimes you don't need to add much. Sometimes it's just a dB or two. And in some cases, it could be even 12. <laughs> right. But I've had times where I actually lowered the volume. I've had records where came to me really loud as mixes and I lowered them a dB or two. And it sounded right because they didn't need the extra dB and and it, it sounded nicer lower. Now that's when you're doing a single. When you're doing a full album, uh, one of the things you do in mastering is create a, a cohesive, a coherent flow where the songs, even if they're different, they feel part of one package. Mm-hmm. And they could be very different, but you can still create the feel that they're belonging to one specific batch or a compilation and each uh project is different because some albums or eps you want them to be as cohesive as possible and some you want them to be less cohesive but still have a feel that are that there is a connection and some you just want to put them as is and just each song has its own feel and you emphasize on that and enhance it so it's depending on how it's packaged, not on a physical form, but more packaged as what is what is represented. Um, there, there's times where I do a record, which is like a 10 song album, and there's four songs or two songs that are way louder than others. And leveling the other ones to get to that volume might damage them. Right. So in that case, I lower those two or four songs to fit the others where they sound better that way. So there's no there's no target in, in, in you know a specific target. It's more per project. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, yes, I do level things up, but that's not the essence of mastering. It's not it has to go to mastering to get loud. It can get loud in mastering and it can get loud and nice too. Sometimes we can get a better volume level that sounds nice where if a mix has a limiter on it that maybe doesn't do the the job as best. Or sometimes it did the job exactly as needed, but we can clean up just a few frequencies to make it um, sound better or just be more easier on the ear. Well, it's it's interesting to hear you talk about this stuff. If I was going to repeat back to you a couple of takeaways, one is that you know, when you talk about enhancing it, it's like you're you're finding the quality in the music that you feel like is where the strength is, and you're trying to find a way to enhance that strength. You know, um, you know, I, whatever whatever the analogy is, you're just you're. Uh, I don't know why makeover came into my mind. Maybe it's because I have a 12 year old daughter who watches a lot of makeup videos <laughs> right now. It, but it, it is makeup. It is. In, in some cases, you know, it could be a face that doesn't need too much makeup and you just put a bit. It could be a face that needs more makeup. You know, there's different approaches. And 
some mastering engineers are great at really cleaning things up and some are great and just getting the mojo and mm. the vibe. Um, to me, it's more about getting the right energy of it, the right musicality. Um, I might not clean up certain things that I think that if I clean up, they'll lose the liveliness of it, where someone else might be cleaning up it really nice and it sounds pristine and the, and the client likes that, you know, it's, yeah. you know, I, for me, what's important is when I like to hear things that move me. I like to hear things that feel intentional and they feel like there's a certain energy that is lively. Um, where some other mastering engineers might be more into how much they can clean it up so you can hear every small detail that mm -hmm. that that's fine as well because that's a, a, a that's a certain aesthetic and and a perspective to work with you know yeah uh, for me sometimes things come in with issues that if you clean that issue up you're losing the energy and and in that case i prefer not cleaning that up and keeping the energy because in the end of the day you know, the energy, the vibe is what drives the person with the music. You know, it puts, it drives, the, you know, it's like, oh, I like this album. I like this record. I like this single. It's because it drives them. Yeah. Uh, and I prefer not losing certain energy for that drive. But at the same time, some others might be doing that and it might fit. Um, you know, because you can send a, a, a mastering job to 10 different mastering engineers and hopefully all of them did a good job but they're all going to be 10 different masters. Some are maybe closer to each other, but still different. And then you choose, if you don't know, if there's no politics involved, then you choose based on what your taste is and what you, what, and what speaks to you mostly. Yeah. And it, one that is actually less good than the other in certain qualifications, but it re, it touches you better. Uh, for example, sometimes I get records that, you know, and this could be a single or EP or or maxi single or an album that feels like it belongs to a certain era, like the 90s or the 80s or 70s or whatever, or it needs to sound like a cassette or a, or a vinyl. And then I'll try to mimic that sound and bring it back to that era or, or format sound. And it will speak with the music, like they'll be communicating really nice. I mean, they don't really communicate. It's just, it just... You know, it, it just, just works uh, together. It works. And then somebody listens to it. It's like, oh, man, this is this brings me back to when I was 19 and listening to these records. I like it. It it, it, it speaks to me, you know, because right, that's part of the the music is listening is an experience. And that's part of the experience is the emotion that you want to convey. Yeah, it's also kind of romantic and nostalgic because a lot of times you're influenced by certain eras and bands. And even if you're doing it now you would like it to sound close to what it was there where how it excited you yeah so so you you are able to actually bring it back uh, i late just lately i did this record that sounds it's like a hard rock classic hard rock style kind of like acdc meets guns and roses meets whatever you want and this band is not any of those in terms of band members and the, you know but 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 actually they had that vibe in the music. So the mix was good. It came in really nice, but it did a, need a bit of taming in terms of, so the hits are not hitting you as hard, you know, how like in digital you can get, you know, right. the, the transients are very fast compared. So I kind of smoothed it a bit. You know, I didn't want to touch it in terms of balancing, but I wanted to smooth it a bit, make it a bit, a bit more organic, analogish a bit more and that's what i did and it was actually lower than the original mix probably by half a db fascinating but, but the overall vibe of it was bringing you back and it didn't sound as digital you know what i mean like even if it's current it didn't feel that digital it didn't feel like tape but still it didn't feel like like hitting you like a like the the more current stuff now and do I, you when you start a project do you first just listen to the mix itself and then do you have a process of taking notes on what you how you feel about it or where you want to go with it and and trusting a first instinct or anything like that the first thing i do when i listen to a project is i'm not listening to the problem 
let's say if there's over like I'm I'm first of all it's it's a quick it's like something immediately. I listen to it. I'm like, oh okay, I get the vibe. Okay, you know what I mean? I, I have to feel it first. You know what right. I mean? And then and I'm feeling it. Okay, this is the intention, this is the idea, you know, okay, it's a psychedelic thing. Oh, it's it's a kind of a slow rock or it's a smooth, it's a melancholic, it's a you know, you kind of try to <clears throat> um um figure out the uh, aesthetic and the styling first and then you continue listening and then you're like you figure out if there's issues you gotta fix some of them some of them you can hear immediately and some you can't hear immediately you have to play around different different pieces of gear trying to think that things out seeing what happens when you add or subtract or experiment with it because some things don't work and you might assume they will work but you have to actually try them out and see if it doesn't work how do you know when you think you're struggling with something a little bit do you have a way of of knowing yourself if you're trying too hard on something uh, well after the initial listen and i'm trying different gear uh, you know because i have i have a lot of chains my mastering console has six inserts and then each insert has a different chain that i can bypass or unbypass different um uh, uh equipment you know compressors eqs line uh, line amps and all that so i'll try different um equipment and different chains and see if it works or not if it helps or not and then also i have different converters for da and ad for capturing and i'll see if anyone does a better job on the other than the other if, if that fixes it and if it doesn't then I try to listen, what is the problem? It could be a certain instrument that's clogging the mix, or it could be that there's certain processing that the mixing had on it that just didn't let it go through. And in that case, I might call the mixer producer and ask them if he had certain things, certain plugins applied. And, and, and we might find that one of them may be was working too hard and uh, or or um, introducing issues like for example there's uh there's certain noises that could come out from certain plugins and you don't understand why it's coming out and it's because there was a, a function that you needed to disable or enable um and uh and sometimes you struggle with something because the mix has a lot of issues um it's just the the way to fix that mix is just going to be changing it too much and if they if they can't fix it i'll have to work with it as is and i'll just give them what i can the best i can but if i struggle with it too much then i'll call them and ask for a change in the mix because in the end of the day we want the best product we we can get and if a best product sometimes requires a team effort yeah just because my part of the job is the mastering it doesn't mean that what is given to me is a hundred percent foolproof and a hundred percent best of what can be. Um, it might be circumstantial that that's what it is, but to get the best result, sometimes we have to revert back and and fix things in the mix, and then fixing the mastering. And I've even had times where a client would re-track a part because during the mastering process we figured out that it doesn't sound that great because it came out it not that the mastering revealed it but during the mastering process we we had a, a new chance to listen to the song and notice that vocals were out of a bit out of tune like mm. back vocals or something in the background was not working right or just that the actual recording was not that great, and if they had the chance to fix it, they fix it, and and the end result was way better. You know, yeah. we're all talking about the end result in the end of the day because that's what people listen to, and that's what brings us the work. Because if it sounds good, it is good. <laughs> if it sounds good, the mixer will get the job, or I will get the job, or the recording engineer will get the job, or all of us will get the yeah. job. Well, so um, let me ask you a question about. A, sp a specific project, you know, you, I know you've worked with Faith No More, and when I was listening um, to that music, I noticed that it had uh, almost a dark sound to it, which made me immediately feel like I could really crank it up. 
and it was music that I could turn up loud and it wasn't going to rip my head off. And I just wondered if you wanted to make any comments about the importance of not getting too harsh when you're mixing and mastering rock music. I know sometimes people talk about, you know, the balance of distorted guitars and cymbals and vocals and things. And um, just wanted to give you, let you comment on that. Are you referring to We Care A Lot Remaster or Soul Invictus? Well, I had written down Separation Anxiety, but I think that okay. was one of the songs. Okay, that's from Soul Invictus. Okay, that album, uh, what's very special about that album is that that album has a lot of different scenes. It's like a movie scene, you know? It's like you have one that is very uh, tense, you have one that's more loose, you have one that's more groovy, and they're very different. Each song is like very different from the other. The overall vibe is like a movie. You know, you do your color correction to make it all sit together. You know, mastering is like color correction too. Yeah, you know? right. You know? um, but um, the darkness that you hear in that album is actually the idea of that album. It's a very dark album, very eerie, very dark, very, um, the emotion is emotion that is held as well. There's a lot of albums that are brighter and, and more, uh, uh, you know, uh, energetic in the high end, but this is not what it was supposed to be. So th we didn't went, we didn't go with that direction. Um, this is a specific aesthetic we went with. There's okay. other albums I've done that were brighter, but this didn't need to be bright. And also this is not a really, really loud album as well. So it needed its dynamics. And it needed to have this flow where you're moving between songs, you're moving between different sceneries. If you listen to other songs uh, like Sunny Side Up, which is very different than Separation Anxiety, or if you listen to Superhero, it's very different. Um, this band also um, didn't do an album for so many years that this was a natural progression from where their latest album would be to what they would do today, like even going crazier. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. You want to do an album that is taking what they, they've been known for and even expanding on that. And the darkness was intentional to in order to keep that vibe. It, it, it wasn't a technical thing like so you can crank it up and it's not going to be harsh to your ears. It was more of an artistic um, intention to have a, 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 a color or a or a texture that is dark and eerie and to keep you in that mood. Okay, where, dig it, dig it. Where in other albums I might go way brighter, but <clears throat> the thing about rock albums being harsh and all that, you know, sometimes the artist wants that, you know, sometimes they want your ears to bleed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, they want, and, and you know, you can't find it. You can say, look, it's a bit too harsh. And some of them will say, okay, let's do, let's do what you say and let's not make it harsh. And in other cases, they'll say, hey, you know what, what you did? We like it, but it is a bit too harsh. Can you smooth that? And I was like, okay, let's smooth that. Because I might assume they want that maybe, you know, and, and I might do it. And they might tell me it's a bit harsh to us because everybody's different in terms of the high mids and highs, how much they perceive as being annoying and not. Um, and sometimes they want that in order to actually create that tension. They, they don't want to crank it up super loud. They want it in a lower volume, and they want that high end to pop. Right, and uh, we didn't talk about this much on this episode yet, but you know the Fletcher-Munson curve and how the human ear hears, if you're going to listen intentionally at a lower at level, you've got, you may need to boost the low end and the high end a little bit more to balance it out. Is that accurate? Well, technically you're right, but there's another thing that happens nowadays is Consumers listen differently than before. You know, they, they listen on earbuds. So they do listen in lower volumes, which they're actually loud volumes for earbuds. But in comparison to a speaker system, they're lower. And the, and the, and the, the actual speaker sits in their ear. So it, the proximity is so close that even at lower volumes, they're still going to get something just because the proximity. Yeah. And... Um, this also reminds me of something that is important. A lot of times people complain about compression, how things are compressed. Uh, even 20, 30 years ago, you had really compressed albums. 
it's not that the compression that it's done the damage as much as the volume level that was so loud that the actual speaker systems wouldn't translate it nicely. There's stuff that is super compressed. If you play some old stuff, maybe it doesn't look like a rectangular brick, uh, you know, but it's still compressed. It's just nowadays uh, people are asking for really loud volume and the amplifiers and speakers, they generate that but it doesn't translate as well if you put them something lower and then just crank up the volume where yeah. it has more microdynamics that the amplifier can work with. But it's not the dynamics is slammed as much more as much as the volume level that does the problem. Um, and regarding the Fletcher Munson, you know what? Some people listen to music as more as background music. Like if they work on their computer and they want some music, they don't crank it up really loud. Um, and then a lot of these speaker systems have like built-in acoustic uh, compensation mm -hmm. or electronic compensation. And then even in lower volumes, you get low end. Like we had loudness button back in the day. Yeah, totally. I love the loudness button. I would always just push it in and EQ it and crank it up. <laughs> more is more, right? That's more is more. more. More is more. All right. Well, so um, another artist that you worked with, um, Maor, was William Shatner. And I wondered if you had any stories you wanted to share about that. The album I did with William Shatner is called Ponder the Mystery, and it's a prog rock album. Uh, the guy responsible for that album is uh, Billy Sherwood. He's the current bass player of Yes. And basically, it's a, it's a, all compositions and compositions by by billy and he um he played uh, on the album as well and there were some guests uh you know from steve i to george duke to dave cause to quite a bunch of people um and he even sang on that billy sang on that and then on it on every song of course and throughout most of the song is spoken words by william shatner so billy would do some melodies and vocal melodies and some words, you know, some lyrics, but the the main thing is the spoken word that exists there, and it's William Shatner. And uh, it was interesting because it, he's speaking while the music is prog rock, kind of more of a post prog rock, you know. Um, and it, it was a cool opportunity because uh, I like Star Trek anyway. Totally. And I like prog rock anyway. And Billy and I, we've done so many records together. I think we've done maybe 30 records together or something. Wow. So anyway, it was fun to do. Uh, and uh, it's funny because I went to one of the AESs and I was just walking the aisle and I heard two people talk. And one guy said to – and they didn't even know me. And then one was saying to the other, it's like, you know, William Shatner has a new album, Ponder the Mystery. I wonder who mastered it. It's like, you know, it's like, and I was like, me. <laughs> and then that's how we got introduced. I was like, really? And yeah, I was, I was part of that album, you know. And, and that, that's, that's right. how we met. And then, and uh, ever since then, uh, you know, it's a funny situation because they they remember that. And I have a, one of my friends, he works with some of the gear. And every time I walk in, 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 in an event that he works in, he and he sees me, he'll start talking about Star Trek. And, and and William Shatner is like, and then he will introduce me as the guy who worked with William Shatner. So that's great. Did did uh, William come by the studio at all, or was this? Uh, did he did he just uh, send you an email later? No, no, I, I I didn't have any connection with him regarding this. It was all working with uh, Billy Sherwood and sending to the label. Um, I met William Shatner when he did a, a live show of that album. Oh, cool. I, and then I got the opportunity to meet him and uh, shake hands and and uh, say hi to him. And that's great. I've heard he's he's funny as hell in person. Yeah, yeah, he's funny and he's really good on stage. And and uh, he was eighty something during that time we did. I mean, he doesn't look his age. And and yeah, and he he's he's very. Um, you know, like very, he's a very smart person and he, his personality just comes out and even on stage. So it was fun and I'm, I'm happy we did it. That's groovy. Um, all right. Well, let me see uh, what other ones I want to ask you about. I made a note about a band called Goat Whore, 
which was a heavy, I guess I called it screamo. I don't know if that's the right terminology no, for it. No, it's not screamo. No, no. Screamo is a, is a, is a, is a different genre. Th- this is a band that is a metal band that is influenced by death metal and black okay, metal, okay. thrash metal. And, um, and they're very heavy and they have very dark lyrics. Um, but they they have a really good fan base and, uh, yeah. Um, are there any stories you want to share about uh, mastering that style of music? Anything? I don't sure. know. If that just goes. I mean, those are like big, deep, like raw kind of vocals. You know? Yeah. Well, it has that vocals too. Um, that album that we did um, was very cool because the whole production involved, which I, I wasn't part of the recording or mixing, you know, production. I wasn't part of that, but. They really went for an organic sound. Um, they wanted to kind of uh, hit hard, but at the same time, very uh, um, natural. And when it came to me to do the mastering, uh, one of the important things was actually make it a loud and proud, but also don't ruin the dynamics because because the way it sounds, there is dynamics in, in the groove. You can hear it. There's, they have some groove in their playing. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things that I emphasized on was getting the dynamics to be um, moving enough so it's still loud, but you can you can feel the groove coming in and out and, and um, keeping the tones as close as possible to what's there. Like really try to keep it as transparent as I can to what it is. And then and then some like and get the volume there and get that. Um, cool. So um, it turned out really good. There's also a specific flow between the songs. You know, one of the things I didn't mention before was in mastering. We also can control the fade in, the fade out, the gaps, the segues between the songs, which affect how we perceive the songs because how a song ends is how we also remember part of it or how it starts. If you hit it immediately or you let it slide in. You know, if there's a fade in, if there's an uh, abrupt cut, if the gap between is longer to give some space for the ear to get a rest and then bombarded it with loud levels or whatever, you know. Um, um, how do you work with an artist internationally and get their feedback on the timing? When I've worked with the mastering engineer in the studio, you know, he's looking at me and I say right there and he drops a marker or something. Have you found any good tricks, uh, anything you want to share with people about you know, getting an, letting the artist feel like they're right there in the room with you, telling them, you know, where to start and stop a song? Well, I've had times where I had lists of where to start and where to end. In some cases, it's perfect. What they gave me was one by, you know, one on one, like whatever I needed, boom, exactly. And in some cases, they were off in a second or two, and that can happen. A lot of cases, what I suggest is this. Let the mastering engineer first do what he thinks because sometimes he'll feel the flow just because after it's mastered, he can hear how the reverb tails are or mm-hmm. how the song ends because after it's mastered, it's louder. Things, you know, sound a bit different, especially on tails, fades, uh, and gaps too. Yeah. So I usually do what I think it is, right? And I send to the client. And then if they feel they need me to make changes, then they tell me, and I ask them, tell me where the song needs to end and where the fade out needs to start. Because I, the fade out tells me you know, where it's starting, but I need to know where the fade ends in terms of the song ends. And then if they need a gap, like we need another second between the songs, they'll just give me a list. But I usually recommend first let the mastering guy do what he wants to do because he might have an idea. And then you know, it could be an artistic thing. Sometimes I like to put segues in certain songs. I, uh, I like to create a certain flow. Some cases I like to make them quicker between or longer between or combined because I want to create a feel where the album is rushing in a certain place and then go chilling in the other place. Yeah. Or and, the, and do you also feel like you pick up on rhythmic cues, like there's a, like the count from the song before it continues, before the downbeat of the next song happens? It can, and sometimes it does, and sometimes it does, but it doesn't do the right thing. Sometimes the count is there, but it just doesn't help the next song. Sometimes you gotta create a, a, a more abrupt uh, 
connection between them. So it ends and boom, it starts, even if the count is not continuing, because you want to create a feel of like, um, um, like a blitzkrieg. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like it. You want to get like, and I'm I'm using these terms because some records are heavy and you want to keep that energy. You want to keep it moving like from moving from one attack to the other attack. And if you keep the rhythmics, you know, by trying to be on the, uh, you know, on the count, it might, it might stay synced, but it might take the attack feel. And you don't want to do that in some cases. In other cases, you want to keep that rhythmic count or in other cases, I like to keep like to chill out a bit and then jump in. Um, it depends the timing of the album. If it's a long album, sometimes it's hard to do that and you want to shorten distances. Sometimes it's a quick album. You want to keep it quick or you yeah. want to let it you know, space out. I've had times where I would sit with a producer here after I finished mastering it and we would do the timings in between, you know, just to, just to have that uh, thing where we sit and and he actually tells me, oh, I want another second here, another second there. And and that's fine with me if they want to do that. Um, I had times where records came in and they had specific timings because they liked certain numbers and they wanted those numbers to be there. Like a song ends at, I don't know, three point something, a number that they like, you know, or they, I had a record, I, I don't remember the number but they had the rec they wanted the duration of the album to be a specific number which means i had to cut certain areas of the wow. song. <laughs> like i had to cut certain spaces just so we could f fit that second in you know and move the gaps quicker or that's yeah, so funny numerology yeah there were some records that i had some numerology in them i yes i admit there were some of those or some of them wanted to repeat the same number um you know that that it would show the same number on all the all the counters you know hours oh, minutes, so funny. like that's great uh, you know whatever it was uh, or minutes and seconds and milliseconds i yeah it's, well yeah. Let, let me ask you about another artist you work with um i wrote down about richie ramon's cellophone um, which was a really cool and different sounding album. Uh, and it reminded me, it was like punk and metal together somehow. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you wanted to share any stories about that record. And that was a very open sound too, as I recall. Yeah, this sound was not dark. It was in a, a bright, more brighter, right? Yeah. 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 It, it was a fun record to do because uh, the you know, mixes came in really good. Um, energy was right. You know, this was putting the mojo in just to kind of, you know, getting it, it was good. You know what I mean? I got something that sounds good. It was more of like, let's find what makes this even more. Yeah, it was, it was a cool, it this just had a cool mojo to it. I mean, it had a almost, I wouldn't say lo fi, but it had like, it, it didn't, it wasn't trying to be precise and huge layers of guitars and, and all frequencies up top to bottom, it seemed like it respected, um, I don't know, I, for some reason, I'm just thinking of garage rock. It just, it just appealed to the part of me that really loves indie rock and punk rock, but it also had a, a metal quality to it. Right. It had a heaviness because he does have a heaviness, like in terms of, it's not, it's not punk that is just on, um, you know, mid range and highs. It, it actually has low end right. more in it. And also on a lyrical, uh, in, 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 on, a, on a lyrical concept, you know, he, there's layers there too of, of, you know, of heaviness, of, of darkness. So the album has that range as well. Uh, when you mentioned Garage Rock, well, he's a, he does touring he's a live artist you know he does the shows so i like to do records like that that have a lively feel to them yeah you know, totally I, if i if i do an album that is a studio project and it needs to just stay in the studio that's fine i'll make it sound as best as i can to meet up with that equation of uh, a project that is a studio project or or a production that is a studio but when i work with artists that have a live uh, show as well. 
I like to make them sound like they have a liveliness too, you know. Yeah, and cool. I've done also a lot of live records. I've done live albums for Rob Halford, for Yes, for Armored Saint, and a bunch of other bands. So liveliness is important for me. And the fact you felt that it has a garage feel to it, garage rock is kind of a live rock, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I felt like I felt like I was hearing the band play together. That that's what my intention was from beginning. And that's what was presented to you. That's what they were. That's what I worked on. That's how it sounds intentional outside. That's cool. Yeah, and I feel like that's what you were communicating when you talked about, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, shine something up and sometimes you have to just go for the vibe of it, um, you know, and a, just, just a good example of like really capturing the vibe, I thought. Um, so there were a couple of other people that you had on your list that you had worked with. Um, you mentioned Sylvia Massey earlier. I wondered if you had any stories about stuff you learned from working with Sylvia. Well, you know, I worked for her for eight months. Um, I was part of the staff. So certain things I, you know, I worked on while she was working with other projects, you know. Um, but so I, not all the time I was with her in mm -hmm. in in the same room with the bands. Sometimes I will work on other stuff. But what I did learn, um, you know, from that is that there are certain tr um, qualities that a producer has. And one of the qualities is, is, um, is a communication skill, knowing how to make the artist bring the best from themselves. And, and Sylvia is really good at, you know, sitting with the artist or say, a vocalist or whoever is there and, and um, you know, making them feel comfortable um, putting out their talent and, 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 and giving more and more and then to, to be in the right place where the performance and the delivery sits together. Yeah. You know, not just their ability in terms of what the performance is, but also the right emotion. So he's a good singer. He sings good. But then getting the delivery of what's there you know, is, is more than just, they sang right. It's, they sang the right thing. Right. Know? And so I, I was, I learned that uh, even though I'm not a producer that does that, but I learned from seeing her do that. Um, and, um, I was also exposed to a lot of gear, which as you know, I love gear. <laughs> so totally. She has, a, she had a lot of gear then in that studio and radio star studio is in weed. And there was a bunch of gear. And so I had the opportunity to play with a lot of gear. And also, um, you know, I had the opportunity to work with her on an album that a band, an artist called Alisa Haley. And the album was called King Cake. And I got the opportunity to mix two songs on that record. Oh, cool. And that, and that album got Grammy nominated. Nice, man. Way to go. So it was, yeah, so I, I got an opportunity. And it was my first time working on an Eve 8038. So I tried what I, you know, I tried to work it and I worked it in a certain way, you know, whatever I could. And then Sylvia came in and showed me a few more things and, and I learned more. And then, uh, you know, she worked on a different project that I was assisting her and I learned more. You know, you, you every person you uh, engage a, a, a work working relationship with, you pick up stuff, you learn, you know, yeah. even if it's on a communication level, even if it's on concept level and of course gear level, like operating. So I learned, I learned how to operate a, a Neve 8038 uh, because she taught me, she taught me the flying faders, you know, before That's that, cool. I didn't know the flying faders. I knew some of the stuff on the, some of the, you know, I figured some of the stuff, but, and of course she taught me some more stuff on the console, but yeah, I, I had a lot of very interesting and unique experiences there that are part of uh, who I am today. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that I made the right choice and, and went there and, and uh, worked for her. And, well, uh, yeah. well I, you know, I remember reading about the studio in Weed uh, in Tape Op years ago, just beautiful looking place that was in a, a converted movie theater, right? Yes, that's exactly what it was. Yes, yeah. yeah, it looks like such a cool spot. All right, well, there was one other person I wanted to ask you about, and then we'll we'll kind of close out with a final question. 
But um, somebody that I actually had the pleasure of working with years ago is Ben Gross from the Mix Room um, in uh, right there in the Valley. And I wondered if you had any stories you wanted to share about working with Ben Gross, um, you know, anything related to, you know, receiving mixes from him to master or yourself. I mean, he's he's somebody who's really, well, he's done everything, production and mixing, but I know he does a lot of mixing. Yes. Well, first of all, Ben is one of the best mixers I've worked with. He's really good. Nice. And not only he's really good, but his mixes, they come in not like they're not square, they're not rectangular, they're not like they have headroom, they have movement. He's really, really, really good at making impact in a mix without it needing to be loud. And when I get a mix from Ben, I work really, 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 uh, how do you call it, uh, careful. Like I, I don't want to ruin it. It's really good. Yeah. You know? It's like his mixes are so good, and and like I said, they're not slammed or something like that. They have the exact compression on every element. They have the exact EQing he needs. They're really sitting there. So when I get a mix like that, I'm just working on enhancing it, and you know, to sound the best I can. I'm not fixing anything there. You know what I mean? His mixes are really, really good. I'm just enhancing, you know, and if there's if you, you know, the tweaks I'm doing are basically for for me to be able to, you know, get the volume there, get that, you know, get the, the movement there. But it's not, I'm not, deal, it's not like I'm working with a problem or anything like that. It's really good. And and Ben is easy to communicate. Um, you know, he's very artistic with his work and you can hear that. Yeah. Uh, very to the point, you know, they're, if they're, you know, he'll, he'll he'll tell me exactly and I'll tell him exactly. And if he wants, I'll tell him what I'm hearing. And if he, and he'll tell me what he's hearing. And if he wants me to make a change, he's very detailed. It's very easy to understand. Um, now, are you guys in the same area of Los Angeles too? Do you kind of all bump into each other at the same coffee shops or, or across town? Well, we've met a few times. You know, we worked on a few projects. We, we met, um, uh, more than probably a few times, but uh, um, he's in Burbank, I'm in Reseda. Right. But um, but um, again, uh, we communicate if it if it was you know phone call, email, chat, whatever is needed. Um, and uh, his background is so huge, and and you know whatever he's done so many things, and yeah, it's easy to communicate with somebody who's done you know a lot of things. Um, another good example is. Uh, Matt Wallace, which I work a lot with, um, it, we're, we communicate so well together that it's it's easy to phone each other and like, hey, Matt, I sent you this. Tell me what you think. And then he'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, either I like it or either I like it, but can you add this or that or the same, the opposite. You know, it's it all starts with communications, you know. Like, and, hey, why didn't you respond to my text? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, we'll text also, but a lot of times it's really about the discussion that you create. Um, you know, um, uh, uh, like other producers that I can mention that I really have a really nice uh, communication is um, uh, Mike Klink. Um, that you know, he's done so many legendary stuff. You know, I grew up listening to the stuff he's done, and and when we talk. It, you know, he can say to me, can we make this fade like that? He will, you know, he'll use certain terms that I know already from our work together. Like, can you add this and that? And I will understand what he wants. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll try different things and we'll see if it works or not. And if not, I'll change. But it's really easy in terms of he knows how to communicate with me. I know how to communicate with him. Um, another person that I that that I have this with is uh, Roy Z. Roy and I have done lots of records together and it's the same thing so we pick up the phone we talk uh billy sherwood i've done more than 30 records with him and same thing you know he will come by and pick up a cd and drive and listen and tell me okay approved print it you know that's great or, or you know or uh billy from billy graziati from biohazard also well we i mean a, a great takeaway is like you know, hearing you reiterate this importance of communication is just a reminder, 
rock stars of the value of building a relationship with with a mastering engineer when you're mixing, you know, building relationships with all the people in the the signal chain. I guess we're all part of the signal chain, really, aren't we? It's teamwork, you know. If you if you really want to get a good product out, you really want to have the teamwork. Now, sometimes there's politics, there's you know things involved. It it sometimes it, when you get at that price, it's really good to actually talk with the person and say, you know, you can you can share with me if there's a problem that. That I need to be aware of just so we don't have a problem, you know, like, is it a problem to recall that because this and this happens and then we need this approval and he will say yes, then you're like, okay, then we don't need to deal with that. I'll work with it as is. And um, I'll tell people up front when we're working together, if if what I'm requesting is a problem, then I'll work with what I have as is. But just feel free to tell me. Don't right. be... Don't be silent. You know, it's like I need to know. Um, okay, Gro- Groovy. So we've been going for a long stretch, but um, this is so great. Let's just jump in and we'll kind of hit the jam session questions uh, rather quickly. When you started out in recording, what do you feel like was really holding you back? Maybe the knowledge experience that I had. You know, it's a long time ago. Um, I can't say exactly. Um, I think that maybe it just, you know, Maybe the knowledge that I had was to a certain degree, and maybe that wasn't uh, helping me get the results I wanted. Um, and then in time, you get more knowledge and experience, and you you get better at it. So yeah. I can't really give you an exact answer because it's a long time ago. So well, that, that was a good one. <laughs> it would be different. That's a good know. answer, though. Um, now, how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? From people? Yeah, in the studio, maybe at that early stage as, you know, advice that really stuck with you. Um, Matt Wallace told me once, he said, he said, as a mastering engineer, you're like a pilot of a plane. You need to take us to where we're heading. To. So it's like, uh, it, it was rephrased differently, but he was... He says, like, a mastering engineer is like a pilot, and we're on the plane, and we're heading somewhere. And that, and my job is to fly that plane to where we're heading. Awesome. And, awesome. and I think that, that, that thing, that, that was, it took me a while to kind of figure that out, you know, where, how I'm as a pilot, because I, I never had a pilot license. But no, just joking. Um, it, it, but it helped me understand some, some things, and it has to do with the confidence of, where we're, where I'm bringing a project to, and and that echoed really well. So, thank you, Matt Wallace, for that advice because that thing was really important. I, uh, just, I just watched a movie last night on TV, and in the movie they flew the plane right into the side of the mountain. So hopefully that's not where we're headed. We're he- we're headed for the landing strip, right? Of course, yeah. Um, um, okay. Another one, if you want. Yeah. Um, uh, Billy Sherwood told me once. He said, "Measure twice." Cut once. Oh, it's great. Great advice. And that that's exactly, you know, it's right. It's like, you know, sometimes it's worth making sure again, you know, just like you make an, a second call to somebody. Are you sure this is what you want? You know, or, you know, just it's better to check twice than to check just, you know what I mean? It's like, just be sure, you know, and, and, and um, sometimes when somebody tells me, we want something. I'll repeat what they ask and say, "Is this exactly what you want? Are you sure of it?" You know? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll back up twice. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. Although, although they say even three times is better than that. You're right. You're right. I have another on the computer, but after once, you know, when I don't have space on the computer, I have to delete it. But yeah, yeah, three is better than two. But at least I have two. So now, how about sharing with the rock stars a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something that they could use on their next session? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll give you two at the price of one, okay? So one thing, and they're, they, they're connected. One thing is if you get a master back from a mastering engineer, don't compare it to the mix in order to see what was lost and what was gained. So first of all, listen to it as if you were buying that record. Because in the process of mastering, certain things come up, certain things come down, certain things are staying in a way. And you might get shocked of that 
thing happening, like something got boosted and you didn't expect it or something got taken down. What's important is if you listen to the song and if it excites you. If it does excite you, then the, that goal was re, uh, achieved. Now, regarding if something came down or came up, then you can kind of think if you need that up or down. Because sometimes what happened is actually perfect. It glued it in a way that actually did benef it benefits from. And sometimes you feel like, okay, now I want a bit more vocal up. Then, then you do a vocal up version. Yeah. Or, or you feel the kick or snare went down. And sometimes it actually needs to go down just to glue it right to feel cohesive. So first of all, when listening to a master, don't compare it. See if you like it, and you're, if you're if you're if you're um, getting if you're getting excited from it, and if yes, you know at least that is achieved. Then, if you want to compare and see if you feel like something is lost, then yeah. But be aware there is going to be changes, and when you compare, you might not like. Okay, the, good advice. Was there a second side to that as well? Yeah, the second side is if you are mixing your stuff and mastering your stuff, or if you're just mixing your stuff. Be aware that what you're listening at that moment is an accumulative effect of the whole workflow. So you're not listening to it as a listener at that moment. You're listening at, at it as somebody who worked on it. The only way for you to listen to it as a listener is to listen to it later on when you're not working on it. Yeah, right. To it. And even then you're biased anyway because you're always knowing what the instruments or vocals are doing. So you know how the lyrics are, you know how the instruments are. You're still biased and you're still not objective to it, but at least when you're judging it, you're judging it after the fact that you mixed. And then your ear is different to it because you're not in the midst of working. And of course, check it on different systems. Um, I recommend around five systems for a mix, not for a master, for, for a mix. Um, like headphones, earbuds, car stereo, computer speakers, and studio speakers. And if you have a hi-fi setup at home or just a you know, micro mini system or just normal system, that as well. Uh, that's more for mixes. In the mastering, it's different because in the mastering you're compressing and all that. Then you can find a really good system that you know well. And, and listen to it. And then if you want to also listen to other systems, you can do that as well. But usually in mixing, um, it, you're, you might not be sure of certain levels of instruments. And then referencing is is better to do on a few more systems, even though yeah. it's not stay cohesive on the systems. But at yeah. least you'll do something. And then the mastering, take one system that you know really, really the best, the one you listen the most to, even if that's the car? If that's where you listen to most of the music and you know the car well, use that as a big reference. Of course, if you can add your studio monitors and your headphones and earbuds, yeah, do that too. But usually the place where you listen the most to music is the place where it's going to be easier for you to reference. Yeah. Okay. Other thing, don't try to compare yourself too much to things out there because everybody's different. And even if you want to achieve certain similar results, remember they didn't record it the same, they didn't mix it the same, and they probably didn't master it the same too. How about sharing a favorite hardware tool? Anything you want to recommend for the studio or for mastering or just for listening? Well, you said listening. I love my PMC IB1 speakers. Okay, cool. I, I love them. They sound really good. I'm blessed to have a good room, so they 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 can really shine, in, you know. Uh, but those are really get really great speakers, and and I really like them. Um, in terms of tools, uh, I have a lot of hardware, um, so you know everyone has its own thing. Uh, it's kind of a uh, like um, I'm really happy with I'm really happy with most of my gear. So it's kind of hard to say which one is the better because each one is different. Sure. You know? Well, the PMC stuff's great. May, is there anything just recent that you're sort of excited about using? Yeah. Yeah. I have a new compressor called the Magic Defi compressor and it's the stereo version. And it's really cool. It has 16 tubes. It's kind of like a, you know, it's a, 
it's like I, I, I don't know. It's a, like a very new Fairchild style, whatever you want to call it. But it, it, it's really good. It has a really good tone. It sounds really nice. Compression is really nice and easy. I'm really excited about that piece. Um, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm really into. Awesome. Uh, I also there's a uh, I also want to tell you there's this uh, Lynx Hilo, which is a really good interface and it has a good A to D D to A, and as an interface it's really good and I like it. Um, I like my mastering console, the Masalek MTC X, MTC One X. Sorry, yeah. MTC One X, great mastering console has a really good transfer section and a monitoring section. Um, I really dig that. Um, now, um, now how, if, about, how about uh, any any software tools that you want to you know talk what? about that you're excited about? Uh, you know, software. There's so much out there, and all of them are good. I mean, even the bad stuff is good because you just find what you work with. You know what I mean? Like. If somebody tells me, oh, that's a bad EQ, wait a minute, I added 1 dB, it didn't sound that bad. You know, maybe something else is better, but it, it wasn't that bad. You know what I mean? Like with software, it's a bit different than the hardware because, it, uh, you know, it, most of the stuff I worked with in software was good enough. You know what I mean? And some of it was maybe better on certain things. But in general, most of them sounded really good. In hardware, it's a bit different because you have electricity involved, you have cables involved, you have conversion involved, you have clocking involved. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, that's why, like I mentioned, the Lynx Hilo because it's a really great interface and it has really good converters. And, you know, the flexibility and routing in it, and it's really easy to work, you know? And I mentioned the console that I use, the MTC-1X. It's a great console. It sounds really good, you know. Um, I'll tell you this. There is a piece of gear which is called, which is a common, it's a, um, it's a collaboration between me as my, or Applebaum Mastering and uh, FCS, which is Foot Control Systems. We're, uh, we're releasing, this is going to happen soon, we're releasing a unit, a hardware unit called the Workshop LTD. And it's a design that we both work together on, and it's um, analog saturator, cool, uh, germanium silicon style. You know, in terms of that type of style of uh, clipping saturation, and uh, it has uh, like line amplifiers as well, and it has two insert points where you you can insert your favorite compression in or EQ on one or or on the other like you have two of them so you can insert two chains and you can swap between them as well so you can swap the order between insert one and insert two let's say you have an eq and compressor and then you can do compressor and eq and then it has other tonal options to change um and we're thinking about having it ready in two months but i have parts of what's happening in there that i use in my mastering chain from some of my custom uh stuff that i've done because some of my gear is either custom modified by the companies or custom modified by me or stuff that was from from the ground up made for very me. cool very cool all right well let me jump to the next question about business stuff um do you have any advice or a resource for the business side of having a studio i mean you talked a little bit about your website is there anything more related to that that you'd like to share with the rock stars yeah yeah, um, I think that to run a good business is first of all to understand that there's work out there and it might require you to go out there and bring the work, okay? And that means that if your work day is based on just the actual work, then, then no, that's not how to run a really good business because to run a good, good business is there's peripheral work, peripheral work in order to keep the business running. Yeah. There's the bookkeeping, there's the promotional, there's the marketing, which is different than the promotional. It, it's part of it, but the marketing is in one way and the promotional is how you work the marketing. And then there's the uh, business relationships. You gotta work that, you know, you gotta be out there ready to take the gig on you. You know, 
Um, <clears throat> I don't have working hours. I have work. That's how I look at it. And if a project comes in and they need it urgent and they mean it, and you, you kind of learn in time that, you know, then you need to be there for them because that work that you're doing for them might bring you more work from them or from their colleagues. Yeah. Um, so it's not like I have normal business hours. And um, so these are the things that I always talk about when I give business advice is the business becomes part of, of you as well and you become part of the business. And you have to, uh, unless you don't want to do that, but if you want to really be successful with that and 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 work all the time that's that's i think what you need to do and and i think uh marketing is important i think advertising is important you just need to find what platforms work for you mm -hmm. and they don't have to bring work all the time part of advertising is to get the name out it doesn't have to actually bring work in yeah but it, it just has to do the job of putting you in front of people Right. I, f I find sometimes the important thing is just to help people remember you when they're thinking about doing something. They think like, oh, yeah, we should send it to Maor. Exactly. Because they're they thinking should. about you. And they should. <laughs> and they should. <laughs> they should. Love yeah, it. but that's, that's the thing. And also, I had people call me and say, the reason I'm hiring you right now is because I can talk to you. Right. And there's no barriers OK, totally. if you're totally busy and you don't have any second to talk to somebody, but you do have somebody who's fronting you who can take the messages for you, that's a different case. But just be aware that some of the people are not going to like it and they're not going to be there to talk with them. And I got hired a few times, more than a few times, probably, because they said, oh, you know, we can talk with you. Where with the other guy, we couldn't. And yeah. the other guy might be better than me, but. The fact that they can talk with me, we can communicate and get the results they wanted. Where the other place, they couldn't talk with them and they felt they're being remote or alienated. You know. Well, good advice. So the next question is hypothetical. I want to take the Wayback Studio machine and we're going to go back in time, find young Maor, maybe you're still in Israel, and you're going to uh, walk up to yourself and say, Young Moor, I've come to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself today, or one day. What, what, what advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? The more you go deep into stuff, the more you know you don't know. And you might f find surprises on the way. So be expect things that that don't go with your rational, because... That's where a lot of people stop believing in things and, and think that everything is snake oil because it's not. There's some things that are snake oil. There's some stuff that are true, and the lines between them are very blurry. And if you really go into deep in audio, you'll find that everything counts and everything makes a difference. So just be open to it and try. And if it works, great. If not, not. But don't set yourself to certain uh, agendas that might change in time. Be that's open. great. Great advice. I think that's very insightful. Well, Mower, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us today, man. It's been a blast hanging out with you. I mean, thanks for giving us so much of your time, too. Um, and Rockstars, thanks for listening. Let the Rockstars know how they can find you online, learn more about you, and how do they come book you for their next project for you to master it? They can email me at m a p p e l b a u m dot at gmail dot com, uh, or can, they can go to my website uh, m a o r a p p e l b a u m dot com or m a p p l e b a u m dot com. I bought that mistake in case there is a mistake. <laughs> but they can also find me on Facebook. I have five Facebooks, so just the type yeah. of Apple Bomb. And they can give me a call at 818-564-9276 or, or again, you know, email me at m-a-p-p-e-l-b-a-u-m at gmail.com um, or just Google my name and find what, what, where the information is. But I'm, I'm very approachable. Fantastic. Uh, well, um, I look forward to hearing more of your records and I look forward to seeing you again at the next uh, conference event, whatever we do, if I'm out in LA or, or maybe I'll bump into you in New York. 
Well, if you're in LA, give me a call. Come by and visit. I'd love to, man. Thanks so much. Um, thank you again for being on the show with us. It was, it was a pleasure hanging out with you. We'll see you around the studio, dude. Thank you. Have a great time. And thank you very much for doing this interview with me. My pleasure, man. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.